Hi, I'm Dr. Hagmar, and I want to welcome you to my website. If you're watching this on YouTube, I want to welcome you to my YouTube video channel. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing our video series on everything you want to know about SIBO. And specifically, I want to talk to you about some of the, the signs and the symptoms. So today's video is going to be titled, The 10 Most Common Signs of, of Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth and When You Should Get Tested. That's a very, very important uh, aspect to understand is, is when you should be tested. Now, if you or a loved one is suspecting SIBO or you have more than half of the signs or symptoms that I'm going to be talking about here shortly, then you'll want to get tested for SIBO and I'll leave a link at the description uh, on my website where you can actually learn more about how to go and have that done. Today's video, like I said, is going to be a part of a video series that I'm doing on SIBO. There will probably be about nine or ten different videos uh, that I think will just provide you with an enormous amount of practical information to take away. Um, I'm hoping that this information will really help you understand many of the points and the fine points, the tuning points, if you will, uh, when it comes to addressing SIBO. And ultimately, it's these fine points that really make the difference between uh, success uh, and failure. Okay. One more thing uh, before we get started and go over the 10 most common clues that you have SIBO is I want you to understand that whenever we talk about gastrointestinal problems, not everybody who has a gastrointestinal problem has SIBO. There are many, many reasons behind diarrhea and bloating and constipation and acid reflux. And so even if you get tested and your test shows up being positive, SIBO may not be the primary cause of your symptoms. And I want you to understand that. You may have many other problems in addition to SIBO. And that's just a, an important point to understand. There's a tremendous amount of overlap uh, in the symptoms of SIBO with other GI problems. Things like leaky gut and things like histamine intolerance or gluten sensitivity, gluten cross-reactivity, lactose intolerance, food allergies, food sensitivities, candida, parasites, bile acid malabsorption, autoimmune diseases, chronic pancreatitis, the list goes on and on and on. But I want you to be aware of those that, um, unfortunately, in today's day and age, um, you know, with, as great as the internet is, we kind of get stuck on a diagnosis rather than looking at some of the other possible scenarios that are going on, okay? So again, while this video series is about SIBO, um, I do want you to know that uh, should you work with someone, it's best to work with a doctor who understands these other conditions and has the experience uh, to determine where and what kind of testing is best needed uh, based on the individual. Now, when it comes to SIBO, I found that if a patient has more than half of these 10 signs or these 10 symptoms, um, along with all of the typical symptoms of SIBO, it justifies getting tested. And in, in these other videos that I'll be doing, I'm going to show you uh, the tests that I recommend, why I recommend certain tests, and I'll talk about the different kinds of breath testing, because there's many different kinds as well, and, and how often you should get retested, okay? Um, all right, so here we go. The 10 most common signs of, of what I call red flags uh, that make me personally think that if a patient comes to me and they have these symptoms, I want to start thinking about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. All right, number one, when a patient develops IBS following a bout of food poisoning, okay, we call this gastroenteritis. And if you think back to the time that your IBS symptoms occurred, did it occur within a year or two of this food, this bout of food poisoning, or shortly thereafter developing the, the stomach flu, okay? Number two, have you ever noticed a temporary improvement in your IBS symptoms after a course of antibiotic treatments? Okay, For some people, um, it's a noticeable improvement, but then gets worse weeks after discontinuing the antibiotics. Um, when these antibiotics, um, what the antibiotics did here is, is obvious. They, they obviously knocked down uh, a bit of the infection, but in later videos, um, you'll learn that antibiotics really are not the best way to treat SIBO. Okay. Um, there is a video that I did uh, already on this topic, again, why antibiotics may not be the best choice for SIBO or IBS. So again, if that's something that kind of, um, you know, just stands out to you and it's something you want more information on, again, I'll leave the link on, on um, watching that video. All right, number three, uh, does your IBS symptoms intensify, do they get worse after eating meals that are high in sugars, starch, carbohydrate, or car carbohydrates, okay? Do they get worse after eating foods and high in histamines, like fermented foods or even probiotic supplements? Okay, and this is a very, very important area. And today's, again, internet craze, everybody is, is taking and drinking uh, f uh, fermented foods and they're drinking bone broth. Well, in many, many cases where a person is struggling with SIBO, while that bone broth or some of these other um, uh, 
you know, uh, approaches might be good for, say, a leaky gut, and sometimes they can make or exacerbate an underlying condition where SIBO exists. So that's why I said earlier, you know, there's usually more than one scenario that's playing out in a person that has these GI issues. Um, the other thing is I, I have put together a free guide that kind of goes through this. And so, again, if you're struggling with these things, um, depending on where you are uh, and watching this video, I'll go over those foods and give you examples of each. So if you're not familiar with the term FODMAPs or low FODMAPs, um, if you go to my website, you can download this free guide. You can look at the list of foods that fall under this category of FODMAPs. And you can very simply ask yourself if you notice that there's any correlation between the symptoms that you experience when you eat these particular foods. Okay, there's a lot of other good information that you can find in that guide too. So um, if you're just starting out this journey or even if you've been on this journey of trying to find solutions, um, this is a good guide to get. Also, one other thing I wanna do is, is just talk briefly about probiotics, okay? Many times if you look at your probiotic, you look at the ingredients, you're gonna notice um, as, you, as you start scanning those ingredients, that sometimes it says FOS, or maybe it says fructo-oligosaccharides, or it says GOS, galacto-oligosaccharides, or it may even say inulin, okay? These are what we call prebiotics. And so sometimes prebiotics, again, can exacerbate an overgrowth issue. So just something to be aware of. Um, again, these probiotics, while again, they're of tremendous benefit long-term, in the short term when somebody's experiencing SIBO, they can, without a doubt, they can flare up the bloating, the constipation, the diarrhea, and the gas. So again, just be aware of that. Uh, reason number four you should be suspicious of SIBO is do you notice that after eating uh, more fiber that you, incre you have an increase in constipation, you have an increase in bloating, or you have more pain along the right side of your abdomen? If so, again, this is another potential sign that you have SIBO. Um, reason number five, okay, if you're having all kinds of problems with your skin, maybe you have rosacea, maybe you have eczema, maybe you have psoriasis, maybe you have acne, okay, maybe you're breaking out in rashes, maybe you've had these problems your entire life, maybe they just started a few weeks ago or a few months ago um, or after a gut infection, okay. Here's the thing, SIBO is very often connected to problems in the gut, okay. So again, this is an area, if this is something of more interest to you, there is a video that I did on this as well titled, uh, Why the Gut Holds the Key to Healthier Skin. And on that video, I go through some of the most current literature showing and supporting the connection, what researchers have found to, to be the relationship between the skin and the gut. So again, you can watch that video. Um, reason number six, if you are someone that has low thyroid, right? Maybe you have low thyroid symptoms. You have fatigue, weight gain, depression, anxiety. You feel cold all the time. You're trying to lose weight. You've cut out a lot of excess junk food, but you're not getting rid of that weight. There could be a thyroid problem there, and unless you improve the thyroid, um, you're not going to improve your gut, okay? So that's, again, another important area. There's a strong, strong, strong correlation between thyroid disease and gut health, okay? The thyroid depends on gastrointestinal function for proper conversion of T4 into T3. And so if you're a person who knows that you have a thyroid problem and maybe you've been working with a doctor and maybe your, your T3 levels uh, show up being low, this also could be impacting your gut and vice versa. Another aspect regarding the connection between the SIBO and thyroid function is that thyroid problems cause low stomach acid. And what we know is that low stomach acid is a major, major cause of bacterial overgrowth, okay? So again, keep this all in mind. Um, you might be taking hydrochloric acid. You know, you might be taking betaine HCL. But again, until you fix your thyroid gland, you'll be missing that piece of the SIBO IBS puzzle, okay? Signs of low stomach acid, it's also important to realize is that the signs of low stomach acid are very, very often similar to the same signs of too much uh, stomach acid, which unfortunately in this day and age, um, when we think of acid reflux, we automatically think too much acid, but that's not always the case, okay? So again, the, the symptoms of low stomach acid can again be very, very similar to those symptoms of excess stomach acid, okay? Burning, belching, bloating, gas, always feeling full, okay? Again, there's all nonspecific symptoms, right? So reason number seven uh, that you might wanna be thinking that you have SIBO is when a person develops IBS or constipation dominant IBS after taking painkillers or opiates, antacids, proton pump inhibitors, or even birth control pills. Okay, maybe you had a, a surgery, maybe you had back surgery. Maybe you had some kind of surgery and you wound up taking painkillers, right? Or maybe you had acid reflux and your doctor prescribed proton pump inhibitors. Maybe you were on these proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux for a period of time, all right? Or maybe you're taking birth control pills. All of these medications um, in one way, shape, or form either tear up your gut, 
disrupt the microbiome and damage what are called the intestinal brush border. And, and this is a very, very important part of the small intestines because this is the area where many of these digestive enzymes that help you break down starches and carbohydrates uh, and, and proteins um, you know, are basically being produced. So if you're taking these medications, they're damaging this part of the, the intestines where those brush border enzymes uh, are really dependent uh, for better uh, digestion and absorption of foods. Reason number eight is um, you have frequent vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Maybe you have chronic low B12 levels. Maybe every time you go to your doctor, your vitamin D levels are low. Maybe you have low iron level or maybe you have low iron storage. Okay, all of these things can show up on routine blood testing. All right, um, and again, that's very important to, to look at, again, the bigger picture of things. Um, asking that question, why is your vitamin D always low? Why is your iron always low? Okay, you have to look into why the reason uh, exists. Reason number nine, uh, this reason really kind of goes kind of hand in hand with number eight. And this one can be a little bit scary because if you're losing weight uh, because you're not absorbing nutrients, you're becoming increasingly nutrient deficient day by day. And ultimately you're becoming malnourished. And like I said, this one can be very scary for many people because it feels like your, your body's just wasting away. Um, and of course, this can be a little worrisome because people, um, when they lose weight suddenly, frequently, um, this can also be a sign of cancer. So again, um, you have to be aware of those things. And if this is happening to you, without a doubt, you should bring this to the attention of your doctor, okay? Um, reason number 10. Um, many people, of course, uh, you may have already done this, but this is a, a real common problem I see as well. Again, makes me think of, of uh, SIBO, is you start out on a gluten-free diet or a dairy-free diet. You stop drinking milk, you cut out butter, you cut out anything that's dairy-related. Um, you're doing, you know, you're, you're following this gluten-free, dairy-free diet to the T, but you're still not noticing as much of an improvement as you really hoped for, okay? Don't give up here, okay? Your problem may be that there are many other foods that you're sensitive to, and until you find out or you eliminate these other major offenders, you might not notice a, a drastic change until you do so, okay? So again, I find that many people who have SIBO, they do have gluten sensitivity, uh, or they do have undiagnosed celiac disease. So again, be aware of these things. Um, I know I said I was gonna give you 10 reasons, but this is another important one as well. And so I would say reason number 11, this is where, again, you have pain or pressure in one of the areas known as the ileocecal valve. And if you look at this picture here, this is the general location of the ileocecal valve. It's on the right-hand side. But if you notice any pressure, discomfort, or pain, then this is a significant finding. And again, in some of the upcoming videos that I'm going to be doing, and I will be uploading, or that you can already find on, the, uh, on my YouTube channel or on my website, I'm going to show you how and, and why this uh, ileocecal valve is so important. I'll show you how to manually release it because it is something that can be done by yourself or by a spouse. And we'll also discuss some of the things that interfere with the normal function of this valve, okay? So there you go. There's 10 plus reasons and 10 plus clues that warrant testing for SIBO. Remember, not everybody has SIBO, but if you can relate to at least more than half of those symptoms, 50% of those things that we just talked about, I highly, highly suggest that you get tested for SIBO and see if it's one of the additional contributing factors that are causing your poor gut health, okay? Hope you liked today's video. Make sure you comment on it below. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure that you stay abreast of the different things we're gonna be talking as we go through this video series. Um, again, the next video, we'll be talking about the different kinds of breath testing. I'll talk to you about the advantages and disadvantages of each kind of test. And then again, I'm also gonna show you what a breath test looks like, as well as talk more about this ileocecal valve and how you go about resetting it, okay? If you're interested in getting tested for SIBO, I'll also put a link uh, on, uh, on this website where I recommend you go for that testing to be done. And so, uh, again, hope you found value in this video. Until next time, take care.